بسم الله بسم الله والحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا So for those who um, are joining us today who weren't here last week to give a quick recap uh, last week we kind of did an overview of just what are the foundational theological beliefs in Islam like what makes somebody Muslim um, and why those theological beliefs are necessary uh, in order for one to say that they practice Islam and if someone was to say I'm Muslim but I don't follow one of these beliefs um, and one could say well that's kind of outside the categorical definition of Islam it doesn't mean that like you go to someone to their faith like, you're not Muslim right but just so we have a base understanding of what renders one to be Muslim is not kind of an outward identity variable but it's kind of yielding to a set of beliefs fundamentally and then the belief informs practice and ritual and other things. Does anybody remember what those three beliefs were that we said? There's one God, right? So Islam is a very pure monotheism um, and so if somebody was to say I'm Muslim but I don't believe in God or I'm Muslim but I believe in more than one God one could say well that's kind of outside of the normative practice of Islam, its theology uh, you could say that, that doesn't qualify as being Muslim, right? What else was there? Yeah. Uh, last prophet. Yeah, so Islam claims, like, theologically, a foundational theology is not just a prophet, but a final prophet, and the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So we recognize, starting from Adam, uh, 120 plus thousand individuals sent as prophets and messengers, to humanity and the Prophet Muhammad being a final prophet um, who was sent as a prophet for all mankind until the end of time and then what's a last um, the third one and a belief in an afterlife right that there's a belief that this world is not simply it but there are multiple worlds of existence that a soul goes through, and we'll talk about that eventually, um, but there's a life that comes after this life. Um, and when we talked about, and kind of distilled a little bit more about the concept of God in Islam, you know, the question was coming up, well, is this like the same monotheistic belief as other systems that are monotheistic? And the idea that there's other religions that claim that there is one God is there, but the essential understanding of God differs in Islam from other religious traditions, right? So the prevailing prism of knowing God in Islam is through a negative knowledge of God, right? That we know who God is by understanding what he's not, because there's a verse in the Quran that says, Laysa kamithlihi shay, there's not anything that's like a likeness to God. So whatever you would conceptualize God to be, you know that he is other than that. That the kind of extent to which we understand things within the prism of our dimensional interaction here, you know, time and space, it's a conceptualization that transcends this understanding. And there's no anthropomorphizing of God within Islam as a religion. Within that, we're going to start to explore and like look at different kind of names that God identifies himself through in the Quran to help just deepen in that understanding of who God is um, or what Islam says like uh, and what the Quran teaches us about God fundamentally. We looked at a chapter in the Quran uh, that's uh, quite often recited in a lot of different prayers it's a very short chapter, it's got a handful of verses. Um, it's called Ikhlas, meaning sincerity. And it essentially is a chapter that just gives us now prevailing qualities of God. Right? It says, say he is God, the one, the source of like refuge. Um, he you know, does not beget nor is begotten, and there is nothing that's an equivalent to him. Right? But in Arabic, 
like a lot of the nuance is there it gets lost in translation so the word for one is ahad um, in this chapter when you're counting in Arabic right this is just a summary of what we did last time because it's going to inform the conversation we have today because we don't want to think about these concepts separate but together so in Arabic it says قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ that say he is Allah the one if you're counting in Arabic like the number one is wahid right um, but ahad is different than that when something is ahad it is not able to it's not divisible right the way that you know I can take this and you know it's made up of different parts you know and if we were to break it down there's like felt inside and ink inside that essentially constitutes this marker as whatever the sum of its parts are to make like a whole right ahad says that or what it denotes is that there you can't it's not divisible into parts right ahad's a very unique word also in arabic because you can't pluralize it you know there's no plural to ahad so the way i can have like one marker or two markers or three markers you can't make ahad into a plural or a dual right are people is anyone here familiar with arabic as a language you are great yeah so like you can have in the way we have in english you know like a singular and a plural in arabic grammatically you can have a singular and you can have a plural but the plural is also like broken down into like you know a small number pluralized a large number pluralized. You also have a dual, which is like two, instead of just one, two, then a few, then many, right? Um, ahad is not like pluralized in any capacity. You see what I mean? And it's speaking about like the uniqueness of the divine, that there's nothing that is like God. There's no comparative kind of entity, creation, etc. And then Samad is what's in the second verse, like the source of eternal refuge, right? Because God is the one that you want to turn to when you're in a place of need. You know, when you're looking for support, you're looking for help. And it connects to this idea of oneness um, because there's that uniqueness in God's self-sufficiency that everything else in existence necessitates reliance on something to exist, but God alone is free of need. Um, and you turn now with your own needs to the divine. And why I wanted us to like recap some of this is because in these like weekly sessions, one of the things that I'd like for us to do is to also just like think and contemplate and reflect. If you've read the Quran, translation, Arabic, it's constantly like telling you as a reader to think deeply. It's not telling you to mute your intellect. It's telling you to engage like via your intellect. You have in all of its pages pretty much words that are like contemplate, reflect, ponder, think, comprehend, understand. And these are all different words in English and they mean different things. They're also different words in Arabic because they mean different things, but they're rooted in the idea that you don't come to this text where you can't really explore the depths of this religion if you're not bringing what makes you uniquely human. That's your intellectual capacity. So you want to think deeply. You want to ponder. You want to reflect. And so much of this religion is not experienced well by Muslims because they stop thinking about what this means at a deeper level. You see what I mean? And it's just about externals and forms. We're going to talk about some of that today. We'll go through mechanics of things, but that's just one part of something that's so much bigger. And all of it always comes back to God and Islam as a religion. So if you don't create a conceptualization for yourself and revisit it quite often, then it's just going to be about the externals and the forms. Do you see what I mean? Like Islam is about God. It's a God-centric religion. And you want to start to connect to God in Islam or your understanding of Islam through the 
capacity you have to conceptualize the divine. Does that make sense? So this idea of God's oneness, his uniqueness, has to be rooted now as we start to understand other ways that he identifies himself to us. Does anybody have any questions on any of that? The other thing that we talked about was just more kind of ritualistic categories of actions that we'll go back to in like 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Um, but just to start off here. Any questions on that? Any thoughts that come up for it? Yes, no? Everybody with me so far? Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Can we elaborate a little bit on like engaging the intellect instead of the other option that you gave, which I there's like a paradox to decision making, right? Does everybody know what a paradox is, right? So a paradox is a statement that seemingly like at its surface doesn't make sense, but then it makes sense when you like really think about it, right? So a paradox to decision making is that when you don't make a choice, you've essentially chosen, right? And a lot of us don't consciously formulate a perspective on God, but then we indirectly have formulated unconsciously a vision of God that we have. And so you want to proactively use your intellect to reflect on who the divine is. And in a way where what Islam offers structurally are opportunities through the Quran uh, as well as through the prophetic example like constructs, terminologies, sayings that can help nuance that understanding. You see what I mean? A part of that's going to require having places of just reflection to begin with. And in modernity, you have a diminishing of places of stillness, right? In New York City, everything's like crazy chaotic all the time. You know, people are always running here and there. And there's not like so much where we just sit and reflect. You know, there's a guy by the name of Joshua Bell. Do people know Joshua Bell? Okay, Joshua Bell... He did a social experiment once with uh, a, a Baltimore newspaper um, where they put him on a DC Metro platform during rush hour and he opened a violin case and he played the violin during rush hour. Right, in New York City, it's not any different. You're on the subway, people are playing all kinds of things. I took my kids to watch Puss in Boots the other day in Times Square and we're walking through train station in Times Square there's like a reggae band playing and my son's like, you know, he's telling me, he's like, Baba, we got to watch the movie, but he's just standing there. He's like bobbing his head to it. I'm like, you're the one that's moving to this, man. Not me. He's like, I'm not dancing. What are you talking about? I'm like, yeah, you are. Um, and so Joshua Bell stands on the DC Metro. He's got his violin case open. He's playing the violin. And he says that pretty much everybody just runs by him. An old man stops for a minute and stares and then leaves after a few seconds he said children when they got in front of him they just stopped and the grown-ups that were with them had to pull them and he said i could see them looking at me over their shoulders until i couldn't see their faces anymore and he said in the few hours he was there he made like 10 or 20 dollars but what's crazy about this is that this man joshua bell is considered to be one of the foremost practitioners of the violin in the world Right, that the violin he's playing that day itself had a valuation of $2 million. And he sold out concert hall after concert hall in that DC metro area where tickets started at hundreds of dollars. And all of these people had the ability to witness this act of beauty for free. They could have just sat there and engaged in something that they tell their kids about and their kids' kids about. But every single one of them passed it by because their hearts were getting pulled by something else. Right? You can't have reflection in states of agitation. And you can't have reflection if your body is what's in control and moving in all kinds of ways through anxiety. You gotta just find like places to breathe. And through those moments, as you reflect on so much else, what the Quran asks its reader to do is to also like think about everything contemplation reflection pondering etc inclusive of like think about who god is to you you get to a place where you think about causality and that if everything came from something there has to be like a starting point that didn't have causation that necessitated its existence 
Because it can't just be this endless loop of there was always something that initiated because the beginning had to come in a way that it didn't require an act to then be the starting point as it was a reaction to another act. Do you get what I mean? Right? Something just had to be without anything else being. Do you know? But you like get to a point where you start to think and you reflect and you contemplate on these things. Does that make sense? So this idea of God being Ahad is something that we want to think about because it's going to inform now how we think about these other things. There is going to come right in the beginning of pretty much every act that you see a Muslim engage in. There's going to be like certain terms and we're going to go through some of them at the end of class today that, you know, if you know Muslims or you're like exploring Islam or you're new to Islam or even if you're born into it, that there's this common like terminology, right? People will say, inshallah, mashallah, alhamdulillah. It's easy to get lost in the words. Um, and people just talk to you like you're supposed to know what it is, you know? Um, we'll break down what some of those words are. One of the things that you're going to hear quite often in Arabic is what's called the basmala. And Muslims will say bismillah, which means like, in the name of God, right? The ba is a preposition that means with. The word ism means name. And then you have Allah. What gets added to this quite often in Arabic is Bismillah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. And these are two of God's divine names that we wanted to talk about today. These quite often get translated as the most merciful. the most compassionate. But right in the beginning, you open the Quran, and on the very first page, it's the very first thing that God identifies himself through, right? In the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. So when we nuance this idea of Ahad, like uniquely one, nothing anthropomorphized, this also applies here. Like mercy, love, compassion, softness, kindness, understanding this at a divine level, it can be through a gateway of human interaction, but both the presence and absence of this on a human level is not the determining factor of what it is exponentially on an understanding of the divine. You see what I mean? We want you to like think about this. When you meet somebody for the first time, what do you tell them about yourselves? Like if I asked you, introduce yourselves to each other, right? Do you two know each other? No. Huh? Great. And what did you tell each other when you said hi when you met? You told us your name, right? You said, hi, this is me. So on the very first page of the Qur'an, Allah is saying, this is me. I am Allah, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Right from the beginning. That's what he is saying. Know something about me, the way you said, this is my name. And then you said what? Like major. Your major, right? Because yeah. we are our jobs. What did you say? Um, we talked a little about where we're from. Yeah. Yeah, and now you know everything about yourselves, right? <laughs> no, you know like little tidbits, but you shared what you felt like you were most comfortable sharing, but also what would help to identify you when you interact with each other, right? You didn't tell like a made-up name, right? <laughs> right? You weren't like, hey, my name is Robert, so nice to meet you, you know? You said, this is who I am. In the space that you're in, 
You have the comfort of being vulnerable to that extent. You're reading this text. Allah is telling you the same way you are introducing to one another. This is me. This is what I'm about. I want you to know this about me because this is what makes me me. He's saying, this is who I am. I am the most merciful, the most compassionate. In Arabic, the grammatical understanding here is really powerful. I'm not trying to get people lost in the language, so just let me know if it doesn't make sense. But the way Arabic functions is that words have like forms to them, grammatically. And we have this in English also, right? Like if you have an ing at the end of a word, you likely know that that's a verb, right? Sitting, standing, speaking, etc. And you can identify that, right? You can learn like a suffix and a prefix and it'll tell you different things about the word. Do you know what I'm saying? And you can see like certain words hidden in other words and they have common meanings to them, right? So the word condition, the word conditional, right? The word conditioner, like these things all have like a similar root Arabic's not any different. Islam, Muslim, Salam, they all have like the same letters. You can hear like the link in those, right? So Rahman and Rahim, they have these letters. Rahma. And this denotes a little bit more than just mercy and compassion, right? Because when you have this root, it's got its own unique element of love to it. It's got an element of like softness, gentleness. It's got then an element of mercy and then an element of compassion. And when you stick these letters into a form, right? Like the way I took the word sit and I put it into the form sitting, it gives you a different nuance, right? I am sitting here versus I sit. Right? The two sentences mean two totally different things, but they still have the same word. Does that make sense? So if I put the rahama into this form, it denotes like that that characteristic is the prevailing characteristic at that time. In Arabic, and you don't have to know this, but just in case, this is called the fa'lan form. So in Arabic, if you are like super tired, I just came from California, I was in uh, the Bay for some meetings and you know, I was by myself, my wife and kids were not with me, so I like hung out with my friends every night, I was there. And I caught a flight that left at 6am and I had to wake up at 3 in the morning to get it and I'm exhausted, right? And somebody said to me, like, how are you feeling? I would say, Ana ta'ban, that I'm so exhausted, exhaustion is me. But that ta'ban, it has that same sound, right? Rahman, ta'ban, you see how it sounds the same? So I'm so tired, tiredness is me, right? If I didn't eat on this plane, anything, I just passed out as soon as I got on the flight. And then I woke up when we were landing, the airline staff said, you know, you're the greatest like customer. We wish all of our like people flying on this plane just slept the whole entire time. And I was like still half asleep, crusty eye boogers in my face. Like, what are you talking about? And they're like, are you hungry? And I didn't even realize I was hungry because I was so tired. But if I was like so hungry that I was starving, right? And language is important. If you've ever met someone who's learning English and you say to them, like, I'm starving, and they look at you, they're like, you're not starving, dude. What are you talking about? That's not what starving means, but you're using it for emphasis, right? So in Arabic, you would say, Jo'an. Like, I am so hungry, hunger is me. It's my prevailing characteristic. Or if you're super lazy, you know, family member, significant other, loved one is asking you why you don't get done what they are asking you to do. They might call you kaslan, that you are so lazy, laziness is you, right? It's like the prevailing characteristic of you. Does that make sense? 
When we say Rahman, we're saying that that's like the ever-present defining quality. And God uniquely is Rahman. Rahim has that same Rahma, and this denotes continuity, that it doesn't disrupt. It's just always, it's flowing forever. You know, it just goes. And this is what he is telling you. Like, I am the most merciful. I am the most compassionate. Right from the beginning. It doesn't start by saying, I am the creator. Right? I am the nourisher, the provider. You know, I am, you know, the one who made you. That's not how God chooses to introduce himself. And what Islam posits and builds itself deeply upon is that there's nothing without meaning in God's plan. So you'd have to think to yourself, why does this book start off with this type of introduction? The same way one could like psychoanalyze, well, why do you introduce yourself in the ways that you do? Why are you so prone to talk about your job or what you study? And we could like break that down like crazy, right? But Allah doesn't tell you, like, I am the creator, Al-Khaliq. He says, I am Rahman, I am Rahim. Not only is my mercy the prevailing characteristic, but it doesn't disrupt, it just keeps going. And English is like a weird language, right? When you think of mercy, it automatically goes into a prism of like justice in systems that are inequitous. Islam and Islamic law is not similar to Western law. You know, I drive through a red light and I get caught and then I get a fine and that's like how it functions. That's not the point of it. You know, this is like a proactive sense of gentleness, kindness. It's not mercy in light of something that could rear punishment, but it's mercy rooted in love. It's mercy rooted in like softness. Do you see what I mean? This is like the first kind of depiction that we are being given and we're told to think about, you know? Do you believe in like that kind of God regardless of what your faith background is? And have you ever sat down to think about, well, who is God to me fundamentally? Any questions on this? Any thoughts on this before I kind of move in a little bit more on it? Yeah. Uh, earlier you mentioned that um, Law's characteristics are nothing like we could imagine them to be or have experienced them in our lives. So when we're trying to understand the most merciful or the most compassionate, I feel like my natural intuition is to think of what kinds of mercy, I, what is my learned experience in this world, and then say it's something way beyond that. But it seems like it can never be similar to that or related to that. So how do I understand those two like kind of computer? That's things? the vehicle, right? Exactly. What's like a moment of mercy that you can reflect on that you've experienced in your life? Uh, my mom's forgiveness. Great. Anybody else, like, something that you've seen that's just an act of compassion, merciful love? I don't know if that was directed to anyone else. Anybody. <laughs> you keep talking, too. We just had a conversation with you. Right now. Okay. Yeah. But you want to think about this now, right? If the starting frame is one that then understands that the experience can give me a semblance of what real love is, and then I can start to ponder on that. And like a mother's forgiveness is a great example. There's a prophetic tradition that we have that says God is more merciful to his creation than a mother is to his child. I grew up in a Muslim family. A lot of what I was given, whether you were born into Islam, you've converted to Islam, you were exploring Islam, you have to understand that these things make a big difference because they'll then inform how we engage things like ritual and practice. And you could go to most Muslims and the first things they'll tell you are like, here's some do's, here's some don'ts. Without telling you about who's the one that said 
these do's and don'ts in the first place. And what do we understand about that one when we can't necessarily own up to the do's and don'ts? That we struggle with them, we make mistakes, we slip, we fall. There's a narration that I just mentioned. And that narration takes place in the aftermath of a battle. And there's a mother and a child that are separated in the midst of this. And then they find each other and then they embrace. And that's when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says to his companions, do you think this mother would ever hurt her child? Do you think this mother would cause this child pain? They say, of course not, a messenger of God. And he says, no, that God is more merciful to his creation than a mother is to his child, right? For me, I had to unlearn a lot before I could go back to just concrete learning. Because when I picked up the Quran and I actually read it, not what I was told about it, but when I read it, I didn't understand, because it didn't seem like the God I believed in was the God that the Quran spoke about. The God that I believed in it was a conceptualization that left me feeling kind of not watched over, but just watched. It made me feel like I was walking on eggshells. There was a lot of trepidation and intimidation. Everything was just wrong, and I had to feel like unhealthy remorse and guilt about all the mistakes that I made. And then narrations like that are what became an avenue. And then seeing lived experiences, they were like, these people... They found seemingly empowerment and strength. They felt bold and courageous through their belief in God. Why do I feel like I'm in a place where I have to pretend like I'm not Muslim? And there's complexity to that. You know, you're a minority living in a society that is rooted in all of the things that we know that it's rooted in, you know, in terms of bias, racism, anti-blackness. But fundamentally, my inward belief wasn't fashioned by me. It was fashioned by all these externals. And a pivotal moment for me came after I was married and we had our first child. And I could see like this tradition in front of me. And so my wife and my daughter and I, we went to San Francisco where I had been invited to give some talks during our month of fasting, Ramadan. And one of the nights we were there, a lot of people who used to live in the city, alums from here, community members, it's amazing for me when I travel anywhere, I always have people that I can connect with who are like family, that it's always nice to see them. And this group, they took us to the San Francisco Bay to watch the sunset as we broke fast. If you've ever been there, it's a really beautiful scene. And so we went over this like small hill and we were walking to get a better view. And midway through, people had set up some rocks near um, some telescopes to help you look over the bay. And my daughter, Medina, who's now 10, she's probably like the size of this little girl right here and had the same kind of curly haircut. It's a, it was a boy. Yeah, that's what I meant. And this boy, who is definitely not a girl, uh, my son, uh, my daughter, was jumping from rock to rock and was this age. And she has a lot of life and energy to her, especially at that time, right? Same way this kid, running around, like going back and forth, back and forth. You're like, what are you doing? He's a kid, that's what kids do. And so my kid is jumping from stone to stone to stone. And then all of a sudden, she slipped hard, hit the ground, and then she's just crying. My daughter has never really hurt herself so badly before. It was like bumps and bruises. And so my wife, Priya or I, in moments like that, we would just take her and hold her close until she stopped crying. And so Priya went to where Medina was and she held her against her chest. And then she started to turn towards the rest of us. We saw there was a deep gash on her head and blood was going everywhere. Everybody just ran in different directions, water, bandages, tissue papers, we wanted to help Medina, and the whole time Priya's just holding her, and she's just like frozen with her in her arms. We got the bleeding to stop, and Priya's still holding Medina. We finished having a meal with everybody, 
And then we went to this place where I was supposed to speak. I spoke at there. We then left and went and had another meal. This is what Muslims do in Ramadan. We have like five <laughs> dinners. And so we went and had another meal. And the whole time, Priya is still holding Medina. And then we take a cab or an Uber from the restaurant to our hotel. It's now like a little late at night. Priya gets into the bed with Medina, is holding her still in her arms until she falls asleep. Then she still lays there with her and then eventually lets her go after some time and then is standing and just looking at her. In that moment, I asked myself, do I believe in a God that loves me more than my wife loves our child? One that is more merciful towards me, wants what's best for me, more so than Priya does Medina. And it was super hard, but eventually I got to a place where I said yes. And as you're saying, how do we understand experiences? You take a moment like that and you reflect on it, and then you are in awe as to how it can be that a being can so mercifully love another being. And then God's loving mercy for you, which is what Rahman and Rahim together mean, is infinite times more than that. Do you see what I'm saying? But you can't get there if all you focus on are the do's and don'ts, the black and white, the mechanics of it. Then a moral relativism is going to be the basis of religion because why would you want to do something that a God asks you to do that you believe doesn't even believe in you so much? Do you see what I mean? And in Islam, that's not who God is. Many of you are new to Islam, you're exploring Islam, you are converts to Islam, or you're born into it but trying to get a basis for it. A generalization that I'm comfortable making, and I'm a chaplain, I don't like making generalizations. I'm a chaplain, I sit with people and talk to them in specific. They come with strengths, non-strengths, their own experiences. They're not just like a person you push to a YouTube channel to take advice from somebody that isn't even talking to them directly, right? It has to be more specific than that. The generalization I'm comfortable making is that most Muslims you will ask who God is to them, they're not gonna know how to answer that question. Some of them will even get scared or frightened to answer the question. They'll be so paralyzed because they'll say, like, what if I say the wrong thing, you know? But it's like really simple, it's really straightforward. The same way you said when you met her and she met you, this is my name, right? The same way we just met and I said, look at this little girl and mama said, that's a boy, right? <laughs> we learn about things in these introductions. Do you see what I mean, right? So God is introducing himself to you from page one, sentence one, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Not just in the name of God, but in the name of God, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. The most merciful, the most compassionate. You see what I'm saying? This is going to inform everything that comes after. And it's super easy when you start taking Islam 101 classes, or like Muslims start to give you answers about Islam, that it stops being about God. And it's not just the idea that God is the creator of all things, but understanding the, un, the, the, the essence of that creator being through the way that he has chosen to identify himself to you. Right? Does that make sense? Okay, what I'd love for you to do is for like two minutes, turn to the person next to you. What are you taking away from this part of the conversation so far? What are some of the things that you can kind of extrapolate from it, if anything, and then we'll come back and kind of discuss. Go ahead. And so, calling upon Allah's Ar-Rahman, that's like a mercy that's applicable to creation, right? When somebody asks, like, how do you know God is the source of love, or God loves you, or loves all of creation? We're going to talk about this in a few weeks, but one of the divine names the Quran speaks of is that God is Al-Wadud. He's the source of love. 
right? And mawadda is an unconditional love, meaning God doesn't love his creation because they espouse a certain creed or come from a certain culture or a certain class. God just loves his creation because he loves his creation. And he's telling you that he loves creation not because of who you are, but because of who he is. Do you see what I mean? Right? And these are important things to ask because you want to think for yourself now too, right? Where and how you are going to interact with Muslim people. And I appreciate your vulnerability because many of you are going to interact with Muslims who they have no idea what the Quran says about this. And just like somebody might not tell you the nuance specifically of something like legalistic, you know, what do I do in this situation with my prayer if this is happening or that's happening? Do you know what I mean? It's the same idea. Somebody might not be able to actually say to you, this is what Islam has to say about God. This is what God teaches us through the Quran. But it doesn't mean they won't give you an answer. Do you know? And I'm not going to pick on you, but I feel like you won't mind. So let's just use you as an example, right? If you grew up and nobody spoke to you about Allah's Rahmah, but then somebody asked you what Islam is, you'd still give them an answer in the onset, right? Based off of what you've experienced. And it's not that that's not a valid experience, but it's not complete necessarily. Because you can't have like ritual without the one that the ritual's sake is being done for. And that's where the paradox kicks in. Somebody will tell you who God is to them based off of what they're telling you this religion is about. And if you're looking to convert to Islam, you're a new Muslim, you're trying to revisit, you go ask somebody who quote-unquote looks like they're practicing, and the first thing they tell you is, well, you got to do this mechanic and that mechanic and do this and do that. Nobody can give you something that they don't have in the first place to give. And if all they have is the mechanics, then that's what they're going to have, right? But the mechanics are a means to something, not the ends in and of itself. And everything in Islam goes back to God. But your belief in God will be subjective. It's not going to be what's written in a book. For you to embrace it as a conviction, it has to be rooted in here, not just something that's spoken from here. And this is just fact, right? You can open up any Quran and you can see, literally on the first page, right at the beginning, it's going to say this, in the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Maybe the translation will be a little bit different. And then you're going to see it at the beginning of every single chapter that comes after that in the book. Other than one chapter, it prefaces all of them. Like, why? And that's where the thinking process has to come. Don't mute it, right? We're not in a place where we are talking to children whose mental faculties are like my seven-year-olds or my six-year-old or my seven-year-old or my ten-year-olds, right? We're in a place where we're all grown individuals. You have to ponder this question as you would ponder, like creation and existence. And how did this all come to be unless there was a point of origin that didn't like come into existence but just always existed? You start to think about why is God introducing himself as the most merciful? Why is that the first thing that it says? Do you see what I'm saying? You contemplate on it. You start to think about it. Is that your phone? Oh, yeah, the baby's still my phone. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. But you, you get what I mean, right? And in an Islam 101 conversation, this is the foundation of your relationship with the divine. This is it. That's what it has to be built upon fundamentally. He's telling you, Bismillah rahman rahim So you just now have to decide, are you going to yield to that or not? And then in the world, you start to think about this. We have tradition that says that God divides his rahma into a hundred parts. He sends one into this world, and 99 parts remain with him for when we meet him on a day of judgment, right? 
So that mercy is what is there in loving forgiveness from a mother to a child, right? If you see a deer with like its baby exerting compassion and mercy, you see like each one of us who is so elated at the beauty of a child running amongst us, right? None of you are in a place, thank God, that's like, what is this kid's problem, right? <laughs> but it comes from rahma inside of you that you are happy and that's not because it's a child, but it's giving you an indication that your heart is drawn towards things of real beauty at the end of the day. If you were irritated and annoyed and you found ugliness in that, how you see things tells you what's going on within you. And that's not to offend anybody, but that's what you have to understand, right? And a heart that is connected to Ar-Rahman is going to be connected to things of beauty. It's going to be drawn towards things of goodness. And this is foundational, and it's rooted in Allah being Al-Ahad. There's nothing like God. So when I can sit and fall more in love with my wife every day, through every part of what makes her an amazing person, the work she does, she cares for our children, she cares for me, all of these things, that love that I have for her is nothing in comparison to the love that God has for her. Do you understand? And the love that I feel from her and the love that I feel from my kids and all of these things, it's just an opportunity to then reflect on, wow, if this is what love feels like at this level, what must divine love really be? What must this rahma actually be? Do you get what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Any other thoughts? Any questions? Anything that comes up? What else did we talk about in our groups? Anybody? Before we move on, maybe one or two other people. Yeah. Oh, just, uh, it came up in my head that this sort of saying, the, the more that I learn, the less I know. And sort of this idea that um, the, more, the more you engage in something and try to define something right, you uh, can sort of have this uh, realization or recognition that um, you can't really get a grip on it. But it brings meaning still, right? You, you see? So what we didn't do last week that I want to now introduce to you all that's going to be important is just what are like the actual basic elements of Islam as a religion on a whole. And thinking about this dimensionally. So we have the actual name of the religion is Islam, right? Yeah, the answer to that is yes. So <laughs> the name of the religion is Islam. Yeah. Great. We're doing well. But this is broken down now into a few dimensions. You have now Islam, which also refers to practice. You know, these are going to be things like prayer, charity, fasting, etc., pilgrimage. You have what's called Iman, and this refers to theology, right? Faith. And this is like belief in God, angels, scripture, books, etc. You know, there's the last day, messengers, prophets what we call qadr, predestination, the good of it, the bad of it. Then you have what's called ihsan. And this is quite often understood to be Islamic spirituality. And on Monday nights, we're going through a book of spirituality that you're more than welcome to join. We're doing it very slowly. Um, there's a lot more people in that, but you can like interject yourself into it. Um, this is not one of those things you necessarily have to be at every week to kind of take something from it. So these are like the 
fundamental dimensions of Islam, but you want to think about them dimensionally also, right? Meaning, if we put on one dimension what we call now Islam in the sense of practice and ritual, that's like what a lot of people get. If you became Muslim at a later stage of your life, you're exploring Islam as a religion, people reach out to me and they're like, hey, this person that I know is looking at Islam, you know, how do I teach them this, this, and this? Or what are the things that I should teach them? We go to like Sunday school, they're giving you mostly this, which is this. Like the mechanics, the do's and don'ts. That's a part of it, but it's not absolutely the whole thing. If you only have one dimension, which is what a lot of us have, regardless of what you look at, it's going to just look like a line. It's one dimensional, it's simplistic, right? When you add in theology as a dimension, it now brings more to it, right? So if I'm in a place where I have one dimension, regardless of what I'm looking at, it's going to look like this. How much of the world sees you as one dimensional? How you dress, how you don't dress, your skin color, your accent, all these things. Intellectual laziness, racism. It's all rooted in one dimensional perception. I can't see you bigger than the box I put you in. But when I now add in a second dimension to this, the line like gets shaped to it. It goes from being one dimensional to two dimensions. You can have like a line is now a rectangle, it's a diamond, it's whatever, but you can extrapolate more. So I know that there's things that I don't know, but you're still able to ascertain meaning from it, right? That's why the theology is important in relation to the ritual, and the ritual isn't just as a vacuum, but it's like an experienced theology, not just rotely regurgitated and like spit out, that's like there's one God and this and that, but like you feel it, you know, you reflect on it. And then where Ihsan comes in is that it adds now this third dimension. And that's what brings like depth. It brings volume to things, right? Like I am right here in front of you right now, right? Yeah, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> oh my God. And if all, why are you laughing so hard? <laughs> you can't, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like right here in front of you right now, right? If every one of you took steps towards me, not any one of you would take the same exact steps as anybody else. And even your vantage point of me is all uniquely situated to like your positionality in the room, right? That's what like depth necessitates. Islam as a religion is not something that tells us to be afraid to embrace our individual identities. The goal isn't to make you into something that you're not. It's definitely not to commit cultural apostasy. You don't become South Asian or Arab if you become Muslim, right? I'm South Asian, so I'm not self-loathing, right? No offense to any Arabs in the room or other brown people. But that's like, just not what it is. But the ability to find beauty, which is what Ihsan also translates into, it's like a vision rooted in beauty, but not just outward beauty, right? The ability to find beauty and meaning in things. This is what spirituality is. Like all three have to come together to create the ability to find depth in things and meanings in things, right? So what we are doing in the beginning of this is to focus on how these three things relate to each other rather than me standing up here and saying this is how you wash up for prayer and these are the kind of waters you can use to wash up and here's what happens if a uh, animal dies in your water bucket and you're like what i don't even have a water bucket man that's what the book is going to tell you right because it's a manual of law that was written for a place and a time where people had buckets that they made wudu with, right? Where they washed up with. You're just gonna go turn on a faucet. But all of it is going to be just anxiety inducing. 
if it's not about God? Like, what, what's going to be the advantage of me telling you, here's how you get water on every part of your hand, if you don't first connect it to God and understanding and nuancing who that God is? And Allah is telling you, I'm Rahman and I'm Rahim. And then ritual and practice isn't burdensome, but it becomes liberating, right? I'm doing this for an entity that is the source of like loving mercy, that is not like anything else that I've ever come into interaction with, that has limits on its compassion towards me, that has limits on the way that it is merciful towards me or caring or nurturing, but just loves me and wants what's best for me, like that's all encompassed in this first verse of the Quran, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, like in God's name, the source of Rahma, the one who is Rahman, the one who is Rahim. Does that make sense? Okay. I want to be mindful because we went over time last week. I don't want people to go on a marathon. I can talk a lot. How are people feeling right now? People are feeling good? Great. Between this week and next week, what I'd like for you to do is focus on two things. Just go and witness in the world where you see mercy. Like try to pay attention to it. That's like one aspect. Where in your day, in your week, in your, like it's just a week between this week and next. Where do you find mercy? Like merciful love. And it's gonna be eye-opening because if you go a whole day and you don't see it, then that's probably a problem, right? That you're spending an entirety of a day and you can't find anything that's an act of mercy in front of you. Your heart needs to experience that, right? It needs to see that. And where do you see the opposite of it, right? Compromise on ethics, compromise on values, inequity, like greed, whatever you think is the opposite of these words, where do you see that? That's part one, just reflecting on it. Two, when we talk about rahmah, there's... Uh, sorry, I'm going to erase this. So, Muslims believe in what's called the Qur'an. What is the Qur'an, if we gave it a definition? A it's a book. What else? Yeah. A guide. A guide? Yeah. Theologically, what is it? It's the word of God. What do we know about it? It's in Arabic. Huh? It's in Arabic. It's in Arabic. Great. All these things are correct. Right? So no one's saying anything wrong. Right? Anything else we know about this? It was given to the Prophet Muhammad. Great. Anything else? So this is what in Muslim theology and Islamic theology we understand is a revealed text from God to the Prophet Muhammad through the angel Gabriel. Right? There's a distinction between Sunni and Shi tradition in Sunni tradition, it's revealed over 23 years. In Shi'i tradition, it's revealed all at once and then disseminated over 23 years. Right? But it's the same text. And the belief in it of itself is still rooted in what it was. But this Qur'an is understood by that definition. Right? And within it, we'll talk about it and look at it closer. This is like uh, a primary source of... Islam as a religion draws upon this as a primary source of saying, like, this is how God wants us to live our life, right? So we have then also what's called the Sunnah. And the word Sunnah in Arabic refers to the authoritative example of any individual, right? So if we came in here and, you know, somebody... Um, like if you go for the Hajj pilgrimage, has anybody seen like the Hajj pilgrimage pictures of it 
on like Instagram or TV and there's like in Mecca, the Kaaba. So part of the Hajj rites are enacting upon the actions of Hagar, peace be upon her, right? Who is the wife of Abraham and the mother of Ismail, peace be upon all of them. And one of the Hajj rites is you walk between two hills called Safa and Marwa, where our tradition teaches us that Hajar, Hagar, she had her infant child, they ran out of food and water, and she was running up and down these hills as a mother, trying to find some food and sustenance for her child. And then the angel comes and strikes at the feet of the child, the ground, and a well of water called Zamzam springs forth. But when Muslims go as pilgrims to Mecca and they run between these two hills of Safa and Marwa. You're not going to like actually sprint up and down a hill because you know some of you have not gone and we're going to go. It's like much different now. And you're like just walking back and forth. It's a lot easier. But you're following the Sunnah of Hagar when you do that, right? We're following the authority, authoritative example of Hajar, peace be upon her. Does that make sense? So that's what the word means. We understand it from its definition when we talk about Islamic practice, referring to the authoritative example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the Sunnah is derived from narrations that are called Hadith. And the Hadith essentially refers to an action, a saying, or the tacit approval of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So if you saw him do something, he said to do something, or he saw you do something and didn't say don't do that, it all is written kind of within these narrations, hadith. You're going to hear this word a lot. A hadith has two parts to it. It has a part that's called the isnad. This is like a chain of transmitters. So and so said such and such from such and such, you know, back to the Prophet. And then you have a part that's called the Matan. This is like the actual text. And the only reason I'm sharing this is if you go online and you start like looking these up, you can find books of hadith and they're gonna have all of these things and people's names. The names are just the people who like were transmitting the hadith, right? The way like some of you would leave from here and you could go tell somebody and be like, Khalid said this, and then you say that to somebody who says it to someone, and they're creating a chain back to the point of origin of the actual wording, right? Does all of that make sense? Yes? Okay. So there's a hadith. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the other aspect also is the grading of the hadith, maybe? Yeah, so these things have kind of, there's a gradation scale that it's like very rigorously authenticated and there's different levels that go from like the most authentic to um, a slightly lesser degree of authenticity to something that is considered weak in its authenticity to something that is considered to be fabricated, right? You'll find these classifications and we'll go through those you know, as we kind of deepen in the conversation. But you just want to relate to like these three words first. Quran, Sunnah, and Hadith. Like what do they mean? So there is a Hadith that is like the first Hadith that many people teach when they're formally like teaching Islam and many people learn in their engagement of Islam. And that Hadith is called the Hadith al rahma Right? It's the tradition of mercy. And what it says in Arabic, Ar-Rahimun, uh, Ar-Rahimuna yarhamukum ar-Rahman, irhamu man fil ard, yarhamukum man fil sama. Right? So you hear the word Rahman in there like a bunch of times. Right? So, Ar-Rahimuna yarhamukum ar-Rahman, that uh, the merciful one is merciful to those who are merciful. Irhamu man fil ard, be merciful on the earth. Yarhamku man fil sama, the one who is in the heavens will be merciful to you, right? 
in Islam, one of the things that we're taught is that absolutely God is good. And when we think about things, you know, through this prism of moral relativism, somebody might say, this is bad, this is, right? There's people in the world right now who think it's okay to have kids in cages at our borders, right? There's people who literally, like we're gonna see in the next few weeks, when healthcare policy changes, it's no longer an emergency state around COVID, 30% of people who were on Medicare are gonna get kicked off of it, vaccination prices are gonna go up. There's some people who think this is like a good thing. Do you see what I mean, right? It's hard to get lost in the ambiguity of like good and bad when there's so many competing kind of traits that people exert when they're making these types of decisions. What Islam posits are that certain things are just good, right? The Quran is good. The Prophet Muhammad is good. God is good. So the idea then is that if God is good, then you want to try to be like God where you can be. Because if God is good, then being like God is good. So if God is merciful and God is good, then being merciful is good. Does that make sense? So the first thing that I asked you was, like, go and like just see where you witness like mercy in the world around you, or the absence of it. And then the second thing I would say is, like, try to think about what you are doing to interject like loving mercy into the world. Does that make sense? Like how do you actualize this idea of Rahma? And then the last thing that I would say to build a relationship with like this divine name and then we'll start doing it every week on your own. You want to write a prayer in your own words, right? We have ritual prayer, five daily prayers that we're going to talk about probably like three weeks from now, get into it, the how-tos and the mechanics of the prayer. But you also have like supplicative prayer that can be done in any language. Any person can do it, whether they're Muslim or not. The Quran says in a verse, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ وَدِعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ And your Lord says, call upon me, make dua to me, I will respond, right? Dua is just supplication. You can pray, you know, and there's kids right now praying in their dorm rooms in NYU. Like, God, help me pass this class because I don't know what I'm going to do. You know what I'm saying? So what this verse is saying is that anybody who calls on God, that, like, prayer is accepted. They don't have to be Muslim. Like, anybody calls on God, like, God is listening and hearing that prayer, right? And so one of the recommendations in our tradition is that when you have prayers like that, your dua, when it's just you talking to God, outside of ritualistic prayer, you want to use words that are familiar to you, right? Language that is your own language. So what I would ask you to do is just write a prayer in which you're invoking God as Ar-Rahman and you're invoking God as Ar-Rahim. That, O oh, merciful God, O oh, source of compassion, and then what's the prayer that comes after it? You understand? So you start to build a relationship with the divine through this. Does, it, does that make sense? Okay. Any questions on that before just a quick bunch of wrap-up things? Yes, no? Um, yeah. Um, uh, I've never understood the, the concept of merciful without uh, thinking of it in conjunction with you know, uh, forgiveness or punishment. That comes from like just our own socialization. Yeah. Rahma in Arabic is not just like mercy the way that it relates to justice. But Rahma has an element of compassion to it. Rahma has an element of its own unique love to it. Rahma has an element of like gentleness and softness to it. So, All of that's in Rahma. You yeah, know? So that's my question. So how is it different from compassionate? Well, when you have like a mother, like my wife, that is holding our child for hours, that's an act of mercy still in there. But my child didn't do anything wrong, do you see? There's just like loving mercy that's coming from the mother to the child, right? The compassion that's there 
compassion is essentially like if you break it down etymologically it literally means you're like walking with someone through their suffering you know a lot of people don't suffer because they did something wrong a lot of people end up suffering because we do things that are wrong right you know animals in creation they just are who they are but when they live abnormally it's because humans are not necessarily living the ways that we're supposed to right we live in a world right now where more people die of eating too much than eating too little that's crazy right but how does that come into place was well, like well where is their mercy you know where is there like a sense of compassion where is like the softness the gentleness islamic spirituality functions off of a paradox where it understands that a strong heart is a soft heart and a weak heart is a hard heart right and when you think about things right like this is strong not because it's soft but because it's tough right that's not the way our hearts are supposed to be in a spiritual sense and when you interject like loving mercy into the world it's also a source of benefit back to your inward state but that question that you just asked you want to like go and think about it do you get what i mean because we know the meanings of things through the names of things you know what a marker is because i just say marker does everybody know what a marker is right and we all have the same understanding of the word marker camera live stream i don't say to you hand me the cellular apparatus that connects me to a mobile network of millions of people around the world i say give me the phone and you know what a phone is right the way somebody taught you two plus two equals four who taught you what the word love means and how did you learn what it means who taught you what mercy actually is compassion who taught you what rahma is right and it's the fourth word in the quran and the words that come before it one's a preposition right one is just means name and then there's allah and when you put allah next to ar-rahman and ar-rahim it's crazy that most Muslims jump to teach you the how to pray before they teach you who you are praying to. Right? Our experiences are what they are. And then when you have a question, you reflect on it productively. Why do I understand like God's Rahma to be equivalent to inequitous systems as exist today, right? You can't take experiences of injustice. Like, look at Tyree Nichols. How does this happen? How do we like have continuity to challenges with policing, brutality, murder, again and again and again? And that system is what is going to shape for you ideas of justice, injustice. Do you see what I mean? That's where the unlearning becomes a necessary point to being able to learn something. Do you, you see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Okay. Sorry, I know I talk a lot. And I promised everybody last week we would not go until 9 o'clock. We're not going to go until 9 o'clock. So, next week, everybody's here. We're going to continue with some of this. I'll introduce, like, one or two other divine names. It'll go a little quicker. The exercise will be the same. Right? Write a prayer. How do you actualize it? These kinds of things. And then what we'll start to do is go through like the process of some of the actual ritual. So next week what we're going to do is start to go through the process of kind of ritual purification. So it's called wudu. Right? We wash up for prayer, for example. Right? We'll talk about the mechanics of it, the do's and don'ts of it. We're going to literally like bring a bucket of some kind in here, like a table so we don't mess up the room. And we're going to have just like a bottle of water. So I want to show you, it doesn't take a lot of water to make wudu. Right? It's, it's pretty easy. And we'll go through the mechanics of it and how you actually properly make wudu. And we'll talk about different situations that will come up. Right? How do I do this when I'm in the workplace? Like, what do I do when I'm traveling? What happens when, like, I'm outside of my house? So that you're pre-planning and bringing, like, your 
intellect and your strategy to some of this. We'll also talk about like the spiritual kind of understandings of this process of kind of ritual washing, so to speak. It's something that is necessarily understood and taught before prayer is taught, because you have to be in a state of ritual purity, we call wudu, before you can pray, you know? So you can't enter the state if you don't know how to do it. You see what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So why I share that with you is like next week, so we're going to do it, just like wear clothes that you're okay getting wet. You're not gonna get drunk. It's not like it's not like a like a water fight, right? We're not, we're not gonna be like spraying each other and like water balloon. It'll be like really simple, but something you can like roll your sleeves up in if need be, you know, things like that. Because we want to have a hands-on experience, and you want to assume that even if you've done it for years or months, that there's always a benefit in just going back to be like, am I actually doing it right? We have a hadith. I raised the board. We have a hadith where the grandsons of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon both of them, uh, Hassan and Hussein, um, they come upon an older companion of the Messenger of God, and he's making his wudu wrong. They now talk to each other because this is an elder person. They want to have respect towards them. And so they say, like, how should we help give advice? And they come up with the idea that they'll ask the person to judge them who makes wudu the best and then one of them will purposely make the mistake that the elder man does and then when that comes up they'll say like wait you're not doing this right and so they do this in front of the older man and then at the end of it all he like thanks them right because they don't put him on the spot they don't point a finger at him like oh man you suck at this right but there's like kindness and gentleness there but why I share that with you is that in our tradition, this person was somebody who lived during the time of the Prophet Muhammad. And he's considered within like Sunni understandings of who the companions are, they're all considered to be like good people. And he was making a mistake in his wudu, right? That's not like what makes you good, that you're perfect at everything. So that person who is literally learning Islam during the time of the Prophet can make a mistake in this, 14 centuries later, like, it's so, like it, we're making mistakes, right? So it's just like reviewing it, revisiting it, and being comfortable with that, right? And for some of us, it's gonna be our first exposure. So you can just kind of like understand it. We wash our feet in this. So just be ready that, you know, if we actively ask people to participate, that like that's something that might happen also. Probably not with everybody in this room. We'll take people to like, we have wudu rooms that we can show people how to do that there as well too. So you get like a hands-on engagement of it. And then what I want to do is show you like the verse from the Quran, some different hadith, so you can understand, you know, from the legal aspects of this, like what is this based in? And so you open the Quran and you can be like, oh, when I read this verse, like that's the verse that is the base for the how-tos of wudu, you know? So it's not just like aimless, do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Right, because when you study Islam traditionally, what they're also teaching you first is like how to study, you know? It's like going to any school. So as you learn, they're also teaching you how to learn. The way when you go to like elementary school, middle school, you're growing as your like capacity is growing. All of you like have gone through this process. You know how to learn. Now it's just about plugging in the information pedagogically in a way that resonates with the learning systems you're exposed to. You see what I mean? Right? So you can do it a little bit different than a primer text might teach you because a primer text is still teaching the individual how to learn as they're going through the process. So you've gone through a lot of that. So we can say like, here's this verse. This is like how it's broken down. Does that make sense? Great. Anything else before we wrap up for tonight? No? Okay, um, thank you all so much. So next week, um, we'll start with another two names of God that we'll look at, um, and then we'll get into a conversation on um, just the ritual washing uh, and kind of have that be more workshopped as well. All right, assalamu alaikum, thank you.